right, everyone, welcome back to the final session um, in this room for today. And um, before we have the closing keynote, um, this time around, we'll be talking about an interesting topic from Dave, which is know your data, the stacks behind the alerts. Dave works for NGX, um, is, an, is a senior open source technologist for NGX. And um, he also works with DevOps, developers, and architects to understand the advantages of modern architectures and orchestration to solve large-scale distributed system challenges um, using open source as its innovative aspect. Dave has been a champion for open system and open source with a deep interest in observability, WebAssembly, and eBPF for years. He was named one of the top 10 pioneers in open source by Computer Business Review, having caught his teeth on Linux and compiler before the phrase open source was coined. When he is not talking, you can find him hiking with his trusty camera, trying to keep up with his wife. Welcome, Dave. Good to have you here. Thank you, and I appreciate you, you um, giving me such a great introduction, and um, thank you for joining my talk today. Let me grab and share my slides real quick. Um, okay, and... so while you are trying to do that, Dave, I just want to ask you, how long really is it that you've been in this technology um, industry? Like, um, you mentioned something in your profile oh. about being, even before the word open source is coined. <laughs> Um, how long have I been in the industry? Um, let's put it this way. Um, probably um, over four decades. Wow. So, Interesting. Yeah. So I've, I've been involved in this space um, through many, many changes. Um, uh, and open source caught my attention, um, interestingly enough, back in 1992 with a um, technology called Samba, which let us originally share the um, file systems between Windows systems and Unix systems. Um, 1994, I got involved with Linux in 0 0.93. And since then I have been almost uh, purely into some aspect of open source. Um, most recently, uh, my interests are uh, in open telemetry uh, which I've been involved in since its inception. Um, and then um, two things, WebAssembly, which if you haven't taken a, a chance to look at, take a look at WebAssembly. Um, it's a quite interesting technology. And eBPF, or Extended Berkeley Packet Filtering, uh, which gives us insights into our um, running programs without needing to have agents or instrumenting it. So right, today... I'll yeah, leave this for you now. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so today I want to want to talk about something. Um, this this stats behind the numbers, uh, and this kind of came out of a talk I've done several times on sort of the data rules around observability. Um, and what happens is when I'm talking about this, I do talk about some of the things that you need to consider when you're setting up alerts, when you're setting up monitoring capabilities, and I constantly got asked. A, a simple, you know, standard question. So, okay, so this is really interesting. What is the meaning behind this stuff? And so what happened was that I built this first question, which is, what's the difference between mean, median, and mode? Now, if we were live, I'd be looking at the crowd and, and I would probably say that 80 to 90% of you immediately know what mean means. Um, about 60% can get median. And somewhere around 35 to 40 percent can get mode uh, inside of that. And we'll, as you find out real quick, though, this is a trick question. So it's not quite as simple an answer as what you're thinking of right now. So let's start off by pointing out that monitoring, what's setting up this alerting structure, is a numbers game. We use metrics to set up our alerts, and our alerts give us that information and insight into what's going on in the application that we need to be aware of. The numbers themselves can give us insights into the application, but we're using this alert capability to start figuring out what we need to pay attention to. So metrics are the numbers that usually represent a selected behavior. 
They're almost always time stamped, and they're usually represented as key value pairs. So there's time stamp CPU percentage or time stamp request time amount of time it took to do that. However, because of this, our data really to be useful needs to be aggregated, analyzed, and usually visualized. Over here, you're looking at what's known as a red monitoring screen, rate, error, duration. And I've sped it up a little bit because it's, it can be a little slow. And I'm showing you the request information that's coming in on the request basis that's aggregated on a 10 second basis. So I'm looking at all the numbers that are being crammed in um, in a 10 second space broken out to per second behavior. And then I'm also showing you strip charts that are showing you the actual behavior as it's going on. So this is an analysis of a fairly significant amount of data coming in. And we're using the indications to show what the behavior is, is looking like. But when you start looking at this, you have to start wondering a couple of questions. And one of the questions is, how do you deal with outliers? When you have a spike in your monitoring capability, probably set off an alert, how do you deal with that past that point? How do you get representative values between two things that don't match up? So this to um, you know, quote one of my engineers here, uh, how do you compare apples and toasters? So if you're looking at rates and speeds versus percentages and throughputs, they're different things. And how do you start matching up and, and putting these together to get those? How do you get to values that represent rate of change over time? Because not necessarily knowing what this, the current value is, but knowing how fast it's changing may be the most important stuff. And then honestly, do you know what your alert is really showing you? If it's a you know P is less than 5% or P95 uh, values, those are not the same things. And so we need to be able to understand sort of what we're going on. So let's jump into the, the first level example here. Up at the top is a string of data up here, just randomized numbers um, that, that are pushed out here. And looking at this, a mean is a measure of a central tendency. So it shows you in this particular case, the average value of a set of data. Using this data set, my mean is 5.444 and a few other details. The median is the middle value of the set of ordered data. In this case, median is six. If you happen to have an even number, the median is the two numbers in the value averaged out. And the mode is the value that appears most frequently in the data. And so in this case, my mode is one. And so as you can see that I got a range of things that are going on inside of this. So my mean is 5.4 and change. Really? Or is it 4.13 or is it 2.791? And the reason that we have this back to that original question is, can you tell me what a mean is? Is that means are not a single arithmetic mathematical um, progression. We can actually have multiple kinds of means. The one we most often think of, and the one that I'm pretty sure that most of y'all were thinking of is this thing called an arithmetic mean. And an arithmetic mean is commonplace. Everybody kind of knows it. Add the numbers together, divide by the number of numbers, and you have a result here. But you can also have traditional or, or um, the more old style harmonic means, geometric means. You can also have trimmed means, weighted means, moving averages, moving means, if you will, or you know, double exponential weighted moving averages. Um, each of these things has a particular use case. And quite often, they're already implemented in the monitoring software. They default usually to arithmetic mean for this. As you can tell, those numbers are on the previous page. They can give you vastly different results from here because they are actually representing different central tendencies inside of here but they are also useful making for like and unlike comparisons easier. The trick is to figure out which ones you want to use, where you can use it, and understanding why you want to use it. So let's start off with a simple one, arithmetic mean. It's the uh, central point of a normal distribution. And we'll get a little bit into the normal or Gaussian distributions in a moment here. However, the central point of that distribution is not the 50% mark. It is only 50% if the mean is zero 
and the standard deviation is one. And so therefore you can't simply say that the central point in a normal distribution, 50% higher, 50% lower. That's usually the case, but only can guarantee in that particular case, mean zero, standard deviation one. And it's great for comparing things to previous conditions. We use means all the time. And generally speaking, we're aggregating these into time groupings. We can also use this as a rolling time grouping. So, you know, in a 10 second aggregation, I will take the last 10 seconds and average it, compare it to the 10 second before that one second, the 10 second before that one second. And so I can actually use this as a moving target. And this is where that moving mean, moving average comes into play here. In a time series, which is mostly what we're dealing with in the uh, SRE and DevOps space, we're constantly incorporating new data. The new data has to be incorporated as it arrives. We can't afford to necessarily batch it because our alerts need to happen as soon as we possibly know about them. So simple example, the internet's talking to a load balancer. We'll know a little bit about load balancers here at Nginx. And in that, the load balancer is then passing off requests to three different servers inside of here. The first server is serving 2,000 out of a possible 5,000. And you can read them 300 out of 1K, 100 out of 600. Each of those comes down to some number of requests per second here. The arithmetic mean is simple. Add 33.33 plus 5 plus 1.66 divided by 3. And your arithmetic mean is 13.33 requests per second. Nice, simple number. But interestingly enough, when we start looking at this number in an arithmetic mean, looking at the traffic, the services between these three devices is not actually giving you the representative um, number that you would get if you had a single system capable of 6,600 requests per second. If you look at this, we would then need to go to what's known as a geometric mean. Now, geometric mean also is a central tendency here, but it's also used for things that quite often grow exponentially. You'll actually see this used heavily in finance to compare sizes and growth of company. So using that same process, a geometric mean takes all the items, multiplies them together, and then takes the nth root of those. So a geometric mean at this time is 33.33 times five times 1.66, the cube root of that works out to 6.525 requests per second. This, again, compares to that arithmetic mean of 13.33, but it is representative of what this would be like should you be trying to serve that internet through a single machine that incorporates the capabilities of the three machines that are shown here. In DevOps, we see this a lot used for the number of deploys in a unit of time or the average lead time to changes, or your mean time to response, mean time to, to resolving a problem here, or in this case, the throughput. And so geometric means give you this ability to look at these things as if they were a single whole at the same point in time, giving you the ability to balance the, that load, not necessarily arithmetically, which always favors the high end, but to look at this as if this is a single device moving that average. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the third of our traditional ones, this harmonic. And the harmonic is most often used where we are looking at multiple systems. And the multiple systems are very honestly can be anything. In this case, I'm actually using CPU percentages for four systems. And it is the reciprocal of the performance added together and then divided into the number of units. So again, the math is a little bit, a little bit odd, but nonetheless, when we start looking at this, there are two things. Again, if we were looking at this as a single system, we can quickly find that the performance within range of this. So my first systems here, the um, structure looks like is 30%, 40%, so forth. And the harmonic mean is 19.19%. This is an overall percentage used if these systems were looked at as a single system versus looking at as four different systems. However, say that we have a sudden spike that shows up. 
the second one that we use here, 30 and 40 stayed the same. Node 3 dropped to 10%, and Node 4 suddenly started using 80%. My harmonic mean is now 32.82%. Now, it's important to note a couple of things. Any case where we start pushing that upper boundary on our harmonic mean, it can impact that harmonic mean. It can make it less useful in identifying servers or the setting targets for optimal utilization here. In cases like this, it might be better to use a different measure, such as the median or trimmed mean, which are less sensitive to this outlier structure. Why don't we use harmonic and geo geometric? Well, there's a real simple reason. In both of these equations, anytime there is a zero value, this becomes an unsolvable equation. So if I have a value that multiplies something, again, geometric being does multiplication, and I multiply a zero, my result is automatically zero. And therefore, no matter what the nth root is, it's meaningless to actually represent data. Likewise, in a harmonic mean, I'm doing division. And so if my division, if I have a number that divides by zero, you're suddenly going to have an infinite result. Therefore, you can't determine what it is. If you are in a categorization that does not have zero values, or you can do a trimmed model, so I could have a system here instead of four, and I could have five, that has a trimmed model, that means that you can drop that and recognize that that one is not adding or subtracting from its overall capabilities of what is being utilized right now. Keep that in mind. We use our arithmetic means a lot because they handle zeros just fine. But we can use geometrics and harmonics if we don't have a zero value. <clears throat> so the next piece in this, this threesome here is this thing called median. And median is amazingly, amazingly underutilized here. Again, center value of a sorted list right here. And now median is always the 50% point of a normal curve, of that Gaussian curve. Always. By definition, the median is the 50% point for this. Here you're seeing a trace, and the trace, honestly, the red is the median, and the blue is the mean. And I'm calculating this as a, a cumulative average. So over time, you can see what the median looks like and what the mean looks like. And over time, especially in anything that has a normal distribution, they will come closer and closer together. Nothing works up front. If you have two data points, then mean and median are probably not going to be necessarily really useful for you. If you have a single data point, you don't have a mean. So once again, think of it this way. The longer you run your data, the more accurate it's going to be. Now, the interesting piece when we come to this, this median world is that means can be heavily impacted by outlier capabilities. We talked about outliers a little bit um, in the harmonic category. Um, for this. And because of that, that mean can suddenly jump. It's a good thing. You want to know that you've got an outlier category here. The problem is, is recovery. What's called resilience in this space is better if you're in a median space. So again, in this case, I'm looking at, uh, at this line, I'm going along, my mean was 25.5, my median was 26. I had an outlier that suddenly jumped to 250. My mean becomes 31.15. My mean almost jumped six points in here. My median jumped to 26.5. If you look at the recovery, what happened after that, my mean is having to resettle itself down towards the median. So if you're looking at things like historical anomalies, and you're looking at data that says, okay, every Wednesday between 12 and 1, my system has done this. And you suddenly get an outlier category. There's a sale. There's something that happens here. And by the way, outliers can be low numbers as well as high numbers uh, for this. When I look at this, my median will allow me to continue my historical anomaly checks with very little impact, whereas my mean has suddenly changed itself to represent the outlier value as a common occurrence. As we hope, most of the time, our common occurrences are very honestly are not going to be our outlier categories. If they are, the mean will represent that cell over a couple of rounds. Our mean will, our median will start moving up the chain here. So when we're looking at this, 
the um, anomaly detection identifies the data points that are significantly different. Therefore, the median is a better choice for looking at that. So likewise, I'd mentioned that harmonic has the ability to also be used at this. And so let's take a look at this um, from an outlier viewpoint. The outlier in this case jumped to 291. My mean jumped from 21 to 28. My median jumped from 22 to 22 and a half. And my harmonic jumped from 18 to 19. So my neither of the latter two were heavily impacted by the data, by this single outlier. But again, my mean is going to have to spend some amount of time recovering to get back down to what the actual central tendency of my system looks like. And so quick and simple, if you're looking at things that are um, looking for anomalies that are historical in nature or uh, against a central trend, median is your best friend. And so you may want to consider moving to a median approach for your alerts rather than using an arithmetic mean approach if you have an outlier situation. <clears throat> and then the third of these categories, mode. So again, mode's the most common recurring value in the set here. It's usually represented as a histograph. And in this case, we can see that I've got roughly 13 ones that showed up in my original data, nines, et cetera, down here. This is not commonly used in alert structures. It can be, but it's not commonly used. It's used most often in, in things like log analysis or security monitoring, where we start looking at what the common behavior patterns are versus the common data patterns here. It's heavily used in user behavior analysis, very honestly. And that user behavior analysis lets us know what our users are normally trying to do and when we have something that's outlier of that normal behavior, and then we can recognize it as an alert structure for that. So when we look at this, the mode is more a, a secondary aspect. <clears throat> it's a secondary aspect of the type of structure that we're looking at and the way that we're providing and dealing with data. So I mentioned normal a couple of times. Um, and Again, just like everything else, there are more distributions than just a normal distribution. Most of the time when someone says that a normal curve, they're referring to this normal distribution curve. This normal distribution curve is also called a Gaussian curve. It's a bell-shaped curve that's symmetric around the mean. Uh, and it's used to model lead time, cycle times, anything you want that is a uniformly distributed model here. An exponential distribution, uh, on the other hand, is used to look at the, uh, between the time between events that are random and are independent over time. So that the time between the system failures or the time between user requests. A beta distribution, very honestly, it's binomial distribution. You're probably most familiar with it, this with things like A-B testing structures. And then there's some that are a little more um, rare. A Weibull distribution is commonly used to model the time to failure of a system or a component. And then a log normal is where the random variables of lots of little events, their logs are a normal distribution curve, whereas the variables themselves may not be showing a normal distribution curve. So let's take a little sidetrack because I just mentioned this thing called standard deviation. Now standard deviation is the thing that shows you the variability of your data. The larger your standard distribution, the flatter your curve. The smaller your standard distribution, the steeper the, the bell is inside of this. And what the standard deviation does is helps you identify trends and outliers. And it is not percentage-based, though it does give you an indication of percentages here. And it's useful for measurements where we ignore the range. And it, so... By the way, when we do this coefficient of variability, which is what this curve is actually showing you, we are actually looking at the mean divided by the standard deviation times 100 to give me a percentage curve of the coefficient CV, coefficient of variability here. In SREs, DevOps cases here, this is lead time, recovery time. Did something fall outside of our normal curve? Are our alerts all falling in that second band where we're looking at 95%, but we want to keep them as close to the center of Parson as possible. And so when we start looking at the, those structures, it's a very nice curve. And generally speaking, this is the curve you will see. But 
We also have other things, and we're going to dive into this one just because I, I kind of like this. Weibull is usually used for time to failure, and it's defined by a shape and a scale parameter, which can be unbelievably challenging. The math is hairy beyond belief, but the nice thing is there are libraries that just do it for you. There are, in fact, certain um, uh, of the monitoring softwares that will allow you to drop the data in place and put it in here. So if I look at these five components in the computer system, I've got the, a magnetic disk, I've got a memory, I've got power supplies, I've got a solid state disk, and I've got a CPU. And each of these has some time to failure. That's probably part of the either your experience, you've seen this happen before, or as part of the specs within the device itself. So when we take that, we can actually run this through R and see what it looks like. The first part, here, the fit dist distribution plus here gives us the data and then gives us our shape and scale. And it also gives us the standard area or error, error, how close that number is going to actually be. We can then run that through this possibility of failure using that shape, using that scale here, subtracted from one will give us the capability to show you what the chances of something failing in this case in 3000 hours. So the chances of something failing in 3,000 hours is roughly 29% or almost 30% chance that some component will fail within a 3,000 hour model. And so Weibull gives you the ability to start looking at things as your system approaches into life without necessarily looking at each individual component separately. Because as we all know, I've got spitting rust on my, my, on my desk behind me that's been in place and working for years. So next one I wanted to cover was a little bit is this exponential. And the exponential distribution models the rate between things that are unrelated. User requests are unrelated. A user cares about his or her request, how long it took and whether it succeeded or failed. Other than that, nothing else matters to this. And so in this case, I can look at this from a network performance or a user request performance. I look at it as a messaging service, be it RabbitMQ, be it MQTT. I can actually look at all those pieces here and start getting an understanding of what's going to happen. Again, the equation takes up more than this page, but we have libraries that do it for us again. So I'm in this case, I'm going to let R do this. And so I have a user request time in the user request arrival time. And Five seconds, I've got 120 that show up. 10 seconds, I have another 60. 15 seconds, I have another 30. And 20 seconds, I have another 10. And so I can now look at this data and do a fit distribution for exponential to get the rate at which things are coming in. And so I've got a rate that says something is arriving um, at that. And so now I can look at it and say, within the next 10 seconds, I have a nearly 40% chance that a user request will come in. And so this is, again, the quick way of looking at this and saying what the structure should look like. And now, if all of a sudden I don't see a request coming in at 40% um, at in a 10-second window, I may have a problem. And I can use this as an alert structure that is different than simply watching for the traffic to come in because my structure has now representing the unequalness of arrival times. And then finally, the probability distribution function. And the math here is up there. Um, I'm sure there's an R library someplace that, that does this. Um, this is a, a, an interesting structure. Um, so rule one, probability distribution function is not equal to the um, Adobe PDF model or the PDF ISO 32000 standard here. It describes the probability of a random variable occurrence within an observed model. And so you can look at this thing. Generally speaking, it's going to be some sort of a bell curve in here. And it allows you to make decisions that are going to give you an indication of how probable a specific area or how probable a range, which is the area under the graph between two points is. So in this case, CPU utilization, the mean is a 50% utilization. My standard deviation was 15%. 
the probability of a CPU being between 60 and 80% is roughly 5.86. Now, that's a small piece of curve, it looks like, for that. But nonetheless, that's a representation of showing you what there is. The probability of something, in this case, being greater than 1 is 0, because we can't have more than 100% of CPU. Well, we can, because if you go check your computers, you'll probably find that if you're running anything intensive, it'll tell you that it's using 212% of a CPU because we're actually then measuring sort of the core structure versus the CPU structure. You can have multiple cores working. But again, the probability distribution function is simply a simple way of being able to say what the chances are that a particular point or a particular range is going to occur based on your observations. Now, that does bring us to my second sidetrack of this, and that's this thing called descriptive versus inferential statistics. Descriptive uses the entire data set to draw a statistical conclusion, which means that your data set is bounded and so you aren't using anything other than the data in front of you here. It's great for visualization. It can extract trend analysis for here, but it's not necessarily going to show you adaption over time for that. Inferential uses a sample set to draw conclusions. And this gets used most often for prediction. It's most often for hypotenuse testing, it's testing whether you, something is true or not. It can also be used for visualization especially if you're looking at things that happen to have a normal distribution here. However, once we get into inferential, we get into this concept of sampling. And unfortunately, when we deal with monitoring, back in the days when, when monitoring really kind of started, we didn't monitor a lot. We could go you know, find out what the CPU was running, find out how full the disk were, all those type of things, see what our memory structures look like, but now we have a massive data problem. We have observability coming into play here, which has metrics, it has traces, it has logs. And each of these things adds another level of complexity, abstraction, but complexity to us. And so our analysis then becomes aggregated or analyzed in segments, it's time defined. And because of this, we have so much data coming in here that we now look at things that are sampled and become inferential. We can have random, stratified, clustered, systemic, or purpose sampling. And I'm going to take a look at two of these um, in the tracing category. So when we consider tracing and sampling, tracing adds a tremendous amount of data. A trace is made up of its spans. Its spans are the unit of work for each of the elements inside of that trace. And in generally speaking, we have two levels of sampling. We have this thing called head-based sampling, where we choose ahead of time that we are going to record the entire trace. Or we can have tail-based sampling, which is we look at the trace and see what the outcome was and decide whether we're gonna keep that trace or not. So head-based sampling is purely random. Tail-based sampling is not really random. We're actually looking at a result to make a choice that becomes purpose-driven. The fault rate for tail base is coverage. The fault rate for head base is retention uh, between those two. And so when you look at these two things, they provide you a view of what's going on, but it, your purpose may change based on the statistical sampling choice you make. So as an example, the first category here, sampling, I'm looking at the errors per request that are coming in here, and I'm using this as a sample model. When I actually do the sampled model here, I'm not seeing a lot of, of activity. I'm seeing one or two very small errors that are showing up because I'm head sampling, and that means I'm grabbing just as many good as bad. When I look at the no sampling approach, I can actually see I have more errors that are creeping up in each of those time frame segments here. The traces are still there. I've still got all the data, but I'm now actually seeing this underlying error category. You will also see this model in tail-based sampling, but you may not see as many of the blues or the good ones, because again, you're only reserving the ones that are meeting your criteria here. Likewise, the latency distribution, how long something took in a sampled model, um, head-based sampled model, I came out with that one trace at one to two seconds. When I actually look at all the data here, I've got one trace that's in 29 to 40 seconds range. 
So there can be a big difference in what you actually see for your metrics, for your monitoring and for your alerting based on whether you're sampling or not sampling. Now, sampling changes that model from descriptive, use all the data to inferential. And because of that, it can hide outlier behavior. Fortunately, usually we don't sample our metrics and we are getting metrics from our traces. That's that red, I talked about rate error duration model here. But even though we're getting the metrics, the data to what drove that metric may not be available. Therefore, it can make the forensics, what went wrong, a little harder to figure out because we no longer have a direct correlation. Again, we're now in an inferential. We're inferring behavior inside of here. Sampling is a necessary evil. We are talking a lot of data. We have, I have a customer a couple of years ago who was running log files at 48 terabytes per hour. They added tracing into it and it went up to 94 terabytes per hour. They can't keep all that data. They can actually pull the metrics from this and show their live metrics here. And they had to go to a, a model of purposeful sampling where they retained things for a period of time, but only retained things that match certain criteria post that time. So once we start looking at this, sampling becomes really important. So sort of summing up here, statistics are how we actually analyze our metrics. We get numbers coming in every single day for alerts of all sort of structure here. The statistics are that aggregation and their reductions. They're indicating central tendencies and allowing us to recognize the outliers. Statistics do not show individual behavior. And in fact, um, there's a, a, a quote um, in a, a recent book talking about observability and scale for this that says on scale, probability is not your friend. That's not correct. Statistics are not your friend because statistics are showing you all of the behavior as you scale, it becomes more and more uh, evident what has broken. Probability is a chance the odds that something is going to break, but it doesn't change on scale. So um, keep that in mind inside of that. Statistics do not show individual behavior. They show aggregated behavior for this. Most of our choices make use of a very few basics. You're probably never going to run into a harmonic mean. You may never run into a geometric mean, um, but you'll run into arithmetic means all the time. And you should probably be using a median where you are currently using arithmetic means. And you should probably make sure that you're using a P90, P95 value versus a P50 value. Because 50 value is a 50-50 chance that something's happening. Using these others can show you some amazing inferential results that may give you an indication of where things are going well or not going well. And then finally, to, to sort of sum up here, my favorite quote. The most effective debugging tool is still careful thought coupled with judiciously print, uh, placed print statements. Brian Kernigan wrote this in Unix for Beginners in 1979, and it's still true today. Statistics gives us the ability to understand what that print statement is telling us through our programs, be it the numbers, the timestamped metric key value pairs, be it a trace, even be it a log. Statistics allow us to look at the world and make a difference about what it means with understanding of what it implies. And with that, I'd like to say thanks. Um, these slides are out on GitHub under me. You can join if you've got questions. You can join um, the Nginx community Slack um, or contact me on LinkedIn. Any of those ways will get to, to me. And with that, let me turn this back over and uh, see if there are any questions that are showing up. Wow, this is mathematics. <laughs> Advanced mathematics, actually. <laughs> All right, yeah, that this, was really nice. Yeah, th this is a deep math, deep math dive, and amazingly, um, uh, amazingly, how many people have actually liked this talk has always always surprised me, uh, because until I really got into it. I had never even heard of a geometric mean or an error, you know, the difference between these things. And then we have things like the new ones, K-means. K-means are the groupings. If you've got all these points, what are the means of which things group? Uh, and so the, 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 the structures become really fun to look at and the patterns they reveal are just mind-boggling. 
All right. Okay. So if I may ask you, does it really uh, make a difference if you don't um, know what the math looks like? I'm, I'm sorry, it broke up on me. So I'm asking, does it really make a difference if we don't know what the math looks like? Um, generally speaking, we are just looking at the numbers and letting the systems do the work for us. Um, but, you know, if you see a number that's coming up here, particularly um, I talked about the median and mean category here. If you come up with an outlier and you're Amazon on, good, on Black Friday, and your outlier is some not substantial. So um, actually a, a better example, we're coming up on, on the um, Amazon, whatever they call that, the big sales days uh, that come up in July. Um, back in 2017, Amazon made a change to their uh, production environment right before the uh, day took off. And the day took off and everything was actually normal normal curves, but they were expecting an outlier. And because the normal curve was there, they didn't see the outliers that they were expecting to have happen. And so because it was normal, mean was perfectly good, it took them almost two hours to recognize that they had a problem and people weren't able to shop. They lost something like 2.3 billion US dollars an hour until they figured out what was going on. So this talk actually started with an understanding of this difference between mean and median for me. And that's why I really hype on this fact that if you are mean sensitive, use median and get around that problem. Great, great. So just one last question. Um, in your presentation, you did mention about descriptive and um, inferential statistics, which is more valuable and we should focus on. Um, yeah, um, if you have a choice and can it handle the data load, differential is exact, gives you exactly the answer that you can find. Inferential is going to give you the answer that is really the kind of the best fit. Generally speaking, we hope that there's not a lot of difference between the two. If I, in a, that normal curve, if I grab 100 data points or 10 data points, I should still draw the same normal curve because the distribution should be the same. Um, however, if I'm trying to analyze 96 terabytes of metrics data, I am not going to be able to do that with anything short of a quantum computer these days on a real-time basis. And so inferential is your best friend for dealing with data on scale. Um, so again, if I'm looking history and I've got a finite data set, I'll go differential. If I'm sitting in my computer room, looking at my monitor going, is everything okay? I'm going inferential. Um, and so the, 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 the thing is your mileage may vary, but inferential is going to be your best friend for making things happen in real time. Okay, great, 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 great. All right, let me join, um, let me join Timothy by saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for this wonderful presentation today. And um, I believe a lot of people have really learned and um, a couple of things that they will be able to start doing, although it's more of advanced mathematics, but very useful and helpful for the community. All right, okay, great, great, great. So everyone, Thank you for joining us. It's really been an interesting multi-con 2023. So let's all go over to um, the closing keynotes where Roots will be sharing with us some interesting things about what is coming up next. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time and do enjoy the rest of the day. Bye for now. Thanks. Bye.